3D models like you've never seen before. There you are, welcome back. We are going to be talking about this amazing little website, web generator thing called STL to ASCII by Andrew Sink. Andrew Sink, uh, the inventor of the, the, the plotter. I remember we did a stream about that. Him and Uncle Jesse have resin laps, which is really awesome. But he also likes to do really cool projects on the web. And this one is STL to ASCII. Some of you might not know what ASCII is or even how to pronounce it. I've got you. Here we go. ASCII is the... I have to read it because it's been so long. ASCII is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It's a character encoding standard that represents text data as well as control characters. It is a way for a computer to display human readable characters, and it's a way for the human readable characters to be interpreted into the binary that the computer understands. So ASCII itself was invented back in 1981 at IBM by Bob Beamer, and it was a way to, quote, standardize the way computers represent letters, numbers, punctuation marks, and some control codes. Interesting factoid, he also introduced the backslash and escape key to the world of computers and was one of the first to warn about the dangers of the millennium bug, which is also known as the Y2K bug, which was 22 years ago. And this is 1981, so we didn't have any RTX like 3090s in the world. We weren't, we weren't displaying amazing rendered things. We had terminals that could display text. So what people did is created ASCII art. Now, you probably know what ASCII art is, even if you don't know what ASCII is, because if I say, if I'm gonna put a colon and a parenthesis at the end of a sentence, you're gonna recognize that as a smiling face and the precursor to the character graphical emojis that we know about today. ASCII art went way deeper than that because there were ways to then change the backgrounds of certain things and text colors, and what people would do is make incredible menus for old BBS systems or uh, enhance the way text could be read or viewed on a computer screen. It's very deep where the rabbit hole takes you. And it's fascinating for those that are interested in the history of computing. And so I'm not gonna go any deeper here, but I really want you to find out more about it. So I'm gonna put some links in the description for you. Now though, now we can get into the STL to ASCII generator from Andrew Sink, and I have it up on my computer here. And when you first load it up, the default model that Andrew wants to show you is his giant noggin. And it's only giant because he's got a big brain. The model, as you can see, is represented by ASCII characters, meaning human readable text characters, from that character set developed back in 1981. That's fascinating that we're using something that's more than 40 years old to represent 3D geometry in these futuristic machines that we can print things from. So here it is, here's Andrew Sink's head. Now using the mouse, I can drag it around and Andrew can look around. Uh, I can, I can, oh my gosh, there's no neck. Wow. <laughs> so Andrew, used his head as the default just to give you an idea of, of what was possible. If I zoom in, you can see that it's not as detailed and the characters sort of increase in certain areas because we're using human readable characters to define contrast and shading in 3D models. So while the characters do make up Andrew Sink's head, the characters are gonna change depending on the view of the model that we are showing. Now think about it this way. If you bring an STL into a slicing engine like um, Idea Maker, Prusa Slicer, Cura, take your pick, rotating around the model gives you a different view of the 3D geometry. So what Andrew is doing here is the same thing, but rather than looking at 3D geometry, you're looking at essentially a 2D representation of your viewing plane, and he's using human readable characters to describe it. It's just fascinating. Fascinating. So within the user interface, you can also go dark mode and light mode. Uh, you can hit rotate, and that's just gonna slowly put that text represented STL on a turntable for everyone to enjoy. 
You can copy the text to a clipboard. You can also download the text file itself, something you could open up in, in a notepad application. You can also define custom text. So within this field, as an example, Andrew has the entire ASCII character set here, but what if I just put in A, B, C, D, 3D, printing, nerd. And then if I hit update ASCII, now what it's gonna do is just take that set of characters that I've put in and only use those to describe the geometry. And as you can see, it's less than optimal. As with most things, the more data you have to describe something, the better you're going to be able to describe it. So if I remove that, I'm just gonna take away all the text I put in there. I'm gonna hit reset ASCII. There we go, there's Andrew in all his glory and I guess the most detail possible. You also have the ability to do a screenshot. Now, I have an idea. So first, let's bring in an STL that you and I and most people know. That's right, it's the 3D Benchy. Have a look. There's 3D Benchy in all its glory and we can sort of rotate the view around. Benchy's a very familiar shape and while text can only describe graphic detail so deep, you can still tell it's a benchy. You can see the square back part of the benchy. You can see where the flag goes. The text on the back of the boat is not easily represented by text. What is a way in which we use a 3D printer to reproduce something two-dimensional? That's a lithophane, right? What if we 3D printed benchy as a lithophane? If you did that, you would have this. Wow. Here is 3D Benchy created from human readable text and then that text made into a lithophane. Now, this is my first lithophane, so it's not gonna win any awards and I don't know exactly how much detail a 3D printer can do in a lithophane, though I've seen some incredible work. So here, to really see this, we need to put a light behind it and to do that, we're going to cut the studio lights. So here we are, I'm in the shadows and I'm holding something in front of me and you probably can't see it, but what if I put a light behind it? Look at that, that is not the best 3D Benchy I've, I've ever printed, but this is made using an incredible process. We've taken a 3D model and then we've described a view of that model in two dimensions using text characters from a character set brought about in 1981 and then we 3D printed that as a lithophane in three dimensions and now we put a light behind it. We are mad scientists here. So this is cool, right? This is uh, something that I think, while it's, it's not perfect, you know, we can explore, we can create. I'm just not sure that a 3D printer can reproduce the detail necessary to have a graphical image made up of nothing but human readable characters. So I have an idea. You recognize this shape, or at least I hope you do. This right here is Mini Joel made by Wexter. I love my Mini Joel model and being able to represent it in human readable text and, and spin it around. Look at that, that is quite possibly the most 2D Mini Joel crotch I've ever seen. So just like with the Benchy, what I wanna do is sort of move this around and zoom in maybe a little bit and just come up with a really, a really good angle. Like here's, here's just mini Joel kind of poking out, right? Now what I can do is take a screenshot. I can take that screenshot, bring it into Photoshop, highlight all the, the white areas, which are the letters and jump those to a new layer, delete the background layer. I can then save it as a PNG with alpha transparency and I could bring it into Glowforge software and we can put it on the laser. It is done. And to say it's amazing is an understatement. Have a look. Wow. This is incredible. I am blown away at the detail that this laser was able to do. The Glowforge did a fantastic job using the HD engrave. This is blue acrylic that I peeled off the top and I put some white acrylic paint on top and the the detail through the paint is extraordinary. However, it still has the paper backing on the back, which means we can remove it, which also means with a semi-translucent blue acrylic, we can put a light behind it. Let's do it. Bam, look at this. So I've just got my phone light behind this. 
Oh yeah, it just glows through. Look at that. That is fantastic. Oh, so, so cool. It just glows right through. This was incredible, absolutely incredible. Part of the joy of this is being able to relive something from computer past and utilize an, an amazing tool developed by Andrew Sink and then using this future technology of 3D printers and laser cutters to then create art from that. This is way cooler than it should be. On this acrylic here that's been painted over, I used a laser to etch letters and numbers and punctuation. That's all that's on there. But because we can utilize this to create art, we've now given rise to a graphic image of Mini Joel in a striking pose. So now this begs the question, do I do something with lithophanes in the future. So I did a Benchy, not my best Benchy, but it's still, it's a Benchy lithophane created from something interesting, but was that cool? Is that something you would like to see more of? Should I explore the wonderful world of lithophanes? If so, let me know down in the comments. Now, regarding the Glowforge and acrylic and being able to engrave HD to get this sort of detail, like I'm stupid excited about this and I have an idea. Leave a comment down below if you have an idea for something you wanna see represented using the STL to ASCII generator within a laser etched acrylic piece, just like this. And who knows, in the next few weeks, I might explore the comments and look for the highest, the comment with the highest thumbs up. Maybe I will take your suggestion and take the time to use a laser to etch it into some acrylic and then show it off. And then lastly, this really would look cool if I had some diffuse lighting behind it. If you'd like to see me design and 3D print a light box for this, let me know down in the comments. Fingers crossed you say yes, because I really, really want to. This was a lot of fun, and this was especially joyful for me because I got to talk about the, the, the computer past which uh, I was a part of, wow. and talk about how we used future technology to display it. And thank you, Andrew Sink, for that wonderful tool. Obviously, all the links for everything from this episode will be down in the description. If you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more, make more art. And as always, high five.